Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast devoted to TV and film. On this episode, we've got a lot of catching up to do since we haven't had a regular episode in a few weeks due to the Oscars episode and our South by Southwest film and TV episode. So we've got a lot to talk about, like where are all the movie songs and why do we need these long film credits concerning streaming trends and also our reviews of Liam Neeson's newest Land of Saints and Sinners. And we fire up the Ecto-1 to take a ride for Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. So let's get on with the show. My name is Aaron Peterson. Joining me today are my fellow hoes, John Davenport. Hey, buddy. Troy Heinrichs. Hey, buddy. Amanda Sink was actually, she didn't bail, all right? We actually had to switch nights because I made a boo-boo, and so she couldn't be here for this night. We had it scheduled for a different night. This one's not on her. We'll blame her for a bunch of other ones, but not this one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she yeah. she earns it most of the time. This time, not not on her. Yeah, and if you want to hear a normal episode, uh, go to the feed, go to thehollywoodoutsider.com. This week, we're going to talk about just random thing. We're catching up. It's catching up with the host, so to speak. Yeah. It's going to we'll be a good time. I think we'll talk about Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire, and In the Land of Saints and Sinners later, but that's later. Do we have to? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you guys see the Crow trailer? Am I the only one that's hot? I saw the crow trailer. Because we're catching up. We haven't caught up in several weeks, if you haven't noticed. Yeah, Oscars this is the first and something actual conversation best. that didn't involve murder that Aaron and I had in a few hours. <laughs> okay, then. What do you guys think of this? All right, so the trailer's out. We know what the new Bill Skarsgård version of Eric Draven's going to look like. The director of the original Crow, Alex Proyas, said, stop it. Even Ernie Hudson weighed in. He's like, I ain't watching that. I, you know, Brandon Lee died. Da, da, da. But what do you think? Do you guys like the look of this? Do you care? I'm getting kind of sick and tired of this look. Uh, It's not, it's something that's being uh, repeated over and over again now for me because I just finished watching Murder at the End of the World. The guy in Murder at the End of the World uh, looked, had the same haircut, same useless tattoos. And uh, and then we have Bill Skarsgård running around looking like uh, he just got out of a meth lab. So it looks like the Joker. I mean, I know a lot of people made that joke, but it's legit. Yeah, <laughs> it's I, legit. I'm not really <laughs> thrilled with that. I like there's there's like a too much of a scumbag feel to the crow. And I don't I don't feel like the crow should be a scumbag. I think the crow should just be put to bed. I just like they could do any of the other characters. I mean, it's not just Eric Draven. That's not the only character that in the comics. There's a lot of different. It's oh man, I want to avenge my death. It's not that hard. Come up with a different concept. They had a bunch of crappy sequels. Some of them weren't so bad mm-hmm. actually. Do something like that. You know, you don't have to touch Eric Draven. It just looks grungy, and I just there's not enough there for me to go. Man, I can't wait to see him redo the one where Brandon Lee died. Yeah, no, I I can't see it either. I feel it's, bad for Bill like, Skarsgård on that publicity tour. Every single freaking stop is going to be, how do you feel taking the shoes of a dead man? Jesus. He gave his life for the movie. You have that issue, and then you have the superhero fatigue issue, and then you have the, you know, it, it, it was just a good movie when it first came out, the original. So it's like trying to top that with all this other added baggage on it is just a mountain that I don't know if you really want to climb as a studio. So I'm surprised the studio is even taking a stab at this other than the fact that they have the IP and they just want to use it. So they don't have to like release the IP to somebody else. This is a perfect segue. Speaking of stab also saw Nev Campbell is returning to scream. Sorry. I wasn't letting that go. <laughs> well done. Well done. Bravo. Can't let that pass. Uh, what do you think about Nev coming back? She's, She's like, I don't give a damn about Melissa Barrera. I'll take that money. I'll come back to the yeah. franchise. Sure, pay me. No, you're gonna dump, you know, back that dump truck up to my house. All right, Love I can take a break from Lincoln paid. Lawyer. <laughs> hey, she she just wanted to get paid, and apparently they need to pay her now. So, gets Patrick Dempsey some work too because he was her husband in those movies. I mean, does she does she really need to be in the movie though? I guess that's the question. No, I think they're trying to. Uh, save favor, save face, you know, because they got so much flack for the whole Mosa Barrera thing. I mean, she didn't really do anything except express an opinion. You, you don't like it. She didn't need to be fired over it. But they're trying to make up for it. They 
Kevin Williamson, who some people are saying, well, what right does he have to direct this movie? Well, he wrote, you know, Scream. The original. <laughs> so he's got some, some, uh, little, little bit of clout. A little bit of clout there. Yeah. So he's going to come back and I think it'll be fine. We'll, we'll see how it goes. I, I bet it'll be her last one, personally. Yeah. I'm just curious how they're going to work the story around this because we made this nice transition away from Woodsboro. Yeah. I and like now that. we're bringing kind of Woodsboro back in, in a way. So it's, I, I'm just curious to see how this is going to play out from a She's going to be the villain. No, nah, I don't think she'd ever do that. I don't I think, think that's the, that. I think that's the cool twist. I really think like if she becomes <sighs> Ghostface, I think that's oh. really, that's a really awesome way to go with the show. Really? Thank you, Troy. I, I, I honestly, I do. I really think that she's been like, I am so sick and tired of this asshole ruining my life. Let <laughs> These me put assholes, on the Not just assholes. one. There's like 17 yeah. of them at this point. But yeah, let me put on the mask and let me go take care of them before they even start. It's like a pre preemptive strike. <laughs> it's a preemptive strike. <laughs> this is what this is what happens when you know one woman deals with too much toxic uh, toxic masculinity. <laughs> and another segue. Speaking of toxic masculinity, <laughs> you're welcome. The Boondock Saints are coming back for a third round. <laughs> Uh, Sean Patrick Flannery and um, Norman Reedus, I wonder if he'll cut his hair or whatever, but they're going to do a Boondock Saints 3, but they're not going to do it with Troy Duffy, who directed the first two, because he's become problematic. I guess he's got a shouty problem and, and whatnot. But So they're going to come back and do a third one and try to make up for the second one. I like the first one a lot. It's not a good movie, but I like the movie <laughs> a lot. So they blew up a cat. I'm happy with it. Yeah. I'll see a third one. Oh, and it makes it feel like a trilogy then, somewhat. So it's like you have the sure. good movie, it kind of dips down and then comes back up again. Bring Willem Dafoe back. He didn't die. Willem. William Dafoe would be amazing. That's what I said. Willem. Willem Dafoe. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I'm kind of kind of tired of them bringing everything back. We just talked about The Crow. And then we're get- and we talked about Scream. And then we talked about Scream. And now we're talking about Boondock Saints. I mean, there's just too many things we're talking about that we've already talked about over the years. People say this all the time. They don't have any new ideas. But it's got to be something. It's not people. That's not, not Hollywood. I I watch original new movies all the time. You know what the problem is? People don't go see them. So us, we're the problem. Everybody listening, everybody that pays for movie tickets, they're the problem. We're the problem. Not Hollywood. If money only goes to one thing, guess what thing gets made a lot of? Right. That's just how it works. Well, speaking of spe- perfectly good segues, here's a perfectly good segue for me right here. Judd Apatow says, it's wrong to think comedy movies are dead in well, theaters. I haven't even explained what we're doing yet. That was just an opening. That was just an opening. Was- oh, well, see, I'm... Sh- <laughs> okay. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're just going around robbing with things we want to talk about. Go ahead. Go ahead. Judd Apatow. Judd Apatow says it's wrong to think the comedy movies are dead in theaters. It just requires a hit since Hollywood would chase anything that does well. Those are his words in a recent uh, article on Variety. So who says and, comedy is dead? Well, when was yeah, the no last hard, time you gone to the theater for a good comedy? Fucking no Barbie. Feelings? Barbie? Barbie was the number one movie last year. That was a comedy. Was it not? I laughed a lot. Nah, maybe it was not at the patriarchy. Like at <laughs> just jokes. Yeah, maybe it was a dramedy though, not actually a comedy. No hard feelings is probably the most recent comedy. comedy. I would say, yeah, Barbie's still a comedy. I mean, I don't know how you say it's not a comedy. It's a comedy. Well, I I actually didn't say it's not a comedy. I'm just commenting on the idea that Judd Apatow is talking about the fact that com that people are saying the comedy is dead in the movie theater because because like look at uh, over the over the weekend when you had the release on Amazon of uh, Ricky Stenicky, which is a uh, it's a couple it's weeks a, ago, but yeah, yeah, really it's. Like it's We've a, been um, a couple of weeks. It works. <laughs> it's true. I don't know how time works anymore. Obviously. It's a, you know, I, and the thing that was funny is like, I watched it because of John Cena and I'm watching it the whole time. And I'm going, wow, this feels like a Farrelly brother movie. And it turns out it's a Farrelly brother movie, which just was the, something. That, isn't it just the one brother though? It's, it's not, only one of yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. You lost the other one somewhere along the way. <laughs> we, he's, it's not quite Stanicky. Just saying that he didn't Stanicky with his brother. <laughs> <laughs> he he made Green Book and he was like, I'm out. <laughs> oh, I like Green Book. I don't care. Anybody says. Um, yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, you had Barbie, you had anyone but you. That's an R-rated comedy, romantic comedy even. You had no hard feelings, like Troy said. I just 
I don't think people are correct when they say that movies or comedies are dead in the theater. They're just make them funny. That helps. Well, yeah, that does help. I, I just remember there was a time where that you would be going every other week to some sort of comedy or some some sort of movie that like the comedies were the thing back in the Will Ferrell uh, days and Judd Apatow doing things like um, <sighs> train wreck, knocked eh, up, knocked up, maybe train wreck, not so much. It made a hundred million dollars. Uh, it did okay. Okay, all right. Well, then there you go. <laughs> just letting you know. I mean, what are they looking for? Looking for a National Lampoon's Van Wilder type stuff? I think they just want, they're saying not a, it's not consistent, you know? And I don't know if that's necessarily true. I just feel like they're not, they're not as frequent, but, you know, Westerns used to be really big at one, at one point too. Buddy cop movies were huge for a long period of time. Um, comic book movies were huge for a very long time. You know, there's horror movies that were huge there for a bit. And every horror movie was popping. Everything comes in cycles. Yeah. Make consistently good stuff and you will have consistent audiences. I firmly believe that. It was an American fiction, a comedy and nominated for an Academy Award. Yeah, it was. How very dare you to bring facts into this, Troy? What the fuck that did I do? I've been doing that for like 10 minutes and you're like, I didn't say anything about Barbie. Didn't Argyle I didn't just say it wasn't Argyle a comedy. Just dropped I just, in February. Argyle's another one. Well, that one flopped. That's not a good example. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still a comedy. It was made it to the theater. It made it to there. Nobody went and saw <laughs> it, though. I saw it. It uh, just re- I didn't see it in the theater. I saw it mm-hmm. on Apple TV. Exactly. It's it's good. It's good. It's not great. It's not going to yeah. get like huge word of mouth. And it also had a stupid budget. I mean, I think it, I think it made like $100 million worldwide or something. If it would have had a $40 million budget, which that movie should have had, I think it would have been seen as a hit but because it had a 200 million dollar budget that made no sense and when you've seen the movie you're like where'd the money go kind of like there yeah. the flower moon apple apples just throw money away where'd the money go where did the money go i don't know well for killers of flower moon it's to buy all the film because <laughs> yeah, all of the film. film and de niro <laughs> yeah <laughs> leo leo's i think the last bankable movie star now next to tom cruise hmm. trey what do you want to talk about anything um, I was just at the movie theater today and I was kind of like movie credits. I just don't get movie credits anymore because you, you have them. some movies that are like, here's the movie credits, the normal black screen, white scrolling letters, you know, shows you the songs at the end and it's over. Right. And then you have other films where they add something at the end. And then there's other ones where they have these like highly produced credits at the end of the movie that then lead into a stinger that then lead into the long roll credits that then lead into a thing. It's like, why can't we just standardize credits again? That's that. That's my big thing. How would you standardize them? I'm curious. Like, I don't either. You don't need the big, long black rolly scrolly thing anymore. You because you're doing the names, highly, right? Like it's, I think it's a requirement. Yeah, everyone. Yeah. But they do these highly, needs their highly stylized produced ones where you get like, these are the stars. Here's the costume. Here's the casting. Here's the director. And you're done. Boom. Movie over. You know, so you want to you want to kick off the little people. <laughs> it's one I'm here, and you're like, I, I don't want to hear bet. the important people, the big heads. I don't want to hear the departments and the people that are like carrying all the boxes. That's a lot of. I'm not names. saying kick off the little people. I'm saying like if you're gonna do a stylized credit sequence, just do the whole thing stylized credit sequence. You know, don't don't spend the money on all that because that's like ten more minutes of film that you could have done that actually made the story better. Or 10 minutes you could have cut out. Well, why don't you, you think of it this time? way? The movie's actually 10 minutes shorter than you thought it was. Yeah. I, that's the way I usually tend to think of it. Also, they could just start rolling the credits right about the 10 minute mark. Before the ending? Yeah, before the ending. <laughs> the roll and the, Tom Cruise is running toward the end of the building <laughs> trying to catch the guy. And then yeah. it's like all the names start rolling up in front of him. Oh, you know, I'd watch maybe it. little little like word clouds here and there, so they don't really obscure this the the the, the shot too much. But they're just st- stylized into the thing. That's like you know, built the, into the buildings and everything else. Like the names, are yeah, just part of that. All right, I'm in. Yeah. Last ten minutes of the movie, Tom Cruise is running towards the screen. It says Tom Cruise. <laughs> here you Ethan go. Hunt. Here's an incentive to. Here you go. This will help movie theaters, right? How do you get people back to the movie theaters? I'll tell you. Nicole Kidman ain't doing it. This is this Ugh. will do it. I hate that. I saw commercial. the I saw the redone today, by the way, and that is just even worse than it was before. It's terrible, and it's it's short. 
It's just they just shortened it a little bit and changed the they, movies. They, t- they took whatever she cut last time because she's still in the same dress. Yeah. Well, and maybe then she they have likes like one. That one it's dress. a pantsuit, not a dress. Whatever. I don't care. They have they have one movie that's actually on the screen, and then they have another movie that actually fills the entire frame. And it was like, okay, who cut that? That's just stupid. AMC. Good luck getting their sponsorship now, Dick. All right. So, so here's how you bring people back to the theater. <clears throat> if you watch a movie on streaming, all the credits are front loaded. So you got to wait. They only go to the back of the movie if you see them in a theater. Right there, I think that's a selling point. So if I wait and watch it on streaming, you can't fast forward past the credits. It like locks you out of it. And they're right at the beginning of the movie. So you have to watch every single person's name. You got to earn that streaming release. If you go to the theater, they put them all the way at the end. Bam. I just solved I just solved theaters. Either way, no one's watching them because if you <laughs> front load them and lock me out, I'm going to get my snacks and my drinks and the bathroom and all that other stuff. And then I'm like, oh, credits are done. Okay, great. I'll just back it up to two. If, if, I, if I miss the start of the movie, I'll just back it up two clicks. You really don't care about the little people at all. Do you? No, he really it's doesn't. Not I it's not that I don't care about them. It's that. They just standardize the stuff. Just like, it's, it's like, None of us it's like watch we talked them all about the... or pay attention to them all. Anybody that says that they are is a liar or they work in Hollywood. Yeah. Um, it's not like Cannonball Run where I'll sit there and watch the, the all the the f- bloopers at the end of the movie. Oh, I will watch bloopers. Oh, yeah. I love a good blooper reel. Put put oh, the yeah. credits next to some bloopers, man. I wish, they ha- I wish more mo- movies did blooper reels. Inception, <laughs> blooper reel? Come on. Inception? Where did, <laughs> you pulled that out of your ass. All right. I can't, I'm dying Oppenheimer, to, you see the, the blooper reel afterwards. What a joy that probably is. <laughs> oh, so could somebody put Steve out again? Jesus. We drop that giant metal ball and it just lands on the ground every time and never explodes. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got the torch? It's not a bad idea, though, to put some like... um DVD extras as the credits are rolling on one side of the screen, you could have like DVD extras on the left hand side. Sure. Because I mean, right now it's like it's like do 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 cut to black, pick up my phone after credits dot com. Am I sitting here? Nope, I'm not. Okay. Or 4K extras. I mean, I don't want people to think that you're you're actually calling in from the year 2014. Whatever. <laughs> Joy's got a time travel phone. Bonus content. <laughs> Bonus content that's actually bonus content and not things that should have actually been in the movie sure. in the first place. Yeah, sure. I, I would like would like to Walk see like, forever. bonus content at the end of the movie. All that stuff kind of like somehow thro- thrown in in there. Whether it's bloopers, whether it's a this is how we, we shot this scene, that sort of thing. That'd be cool. I do watch bonus content still for things I love, things I really dig. Yeah, I miss commentary tracks though. They don't do them as much anymore, and I miss a good commentary track. Remember when like every time. movie had commentary tracks? Oh, I love that. So I want to know what happened to uh, movie songs like Ghostbusters because I was watching Ghostbusters and then, you know they got the theme song. You have to have it at the end. I they don't make theme songs like that anymore. I mean, I guess Barbie had you know I'm just Ken, so that's probably not a great example. But uh, overall, I can't think of the last one that was really super catchy and stuck with me. Songs written specifically for the movie, yeah. Not just yeah, songs that specifically steal Huey Lewis songs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, like that are written specifically for the movie and that are catchy, catchy, you know, pop songs from movies. It just doesn't really happen much anymore. No, but they're back, they're, they're borrowing a lot from actual top ten charts and from classics and stuff like that. So there's a lot of that that's happening these days, where instead of just making stuff up, there's a lot more of just using nostalgic songs to really push the push the envelope to push things forward. It's just it's Hollywood, Hollywood's just looking to do it cheap, that's which what isn't I'm really cheap because it's it's harder to even clear some of those older songs. It's probably cheaper to just have somebody write something new. I don't know. I don't work in the music industry. I just know that it sucks that we don't have catchy movie songs where I can't sing, you know, the Oppenheimer theme song. <laughs> you know, it's like bombs away or something like that. You know, something <laughs> catchy that Adele wrote <laughs> that really gets you going. She wrote it like right after she wrote the, one of the James Bond songs. <laughs> Maybe. But that wasn't even, that wasn't like a pop catchy one. I mean, Skyfall is kind of, I guess, catchy, but. Nothing like, like you know, Ghostbusters and Purple Rain and things like that. Things are really popped. Purple Into the West. Rain, purple Rain. What did you say, Troy? Into the West from Annie Lennox. 
eh. that they because they go into the West. I mean, that's the whole. Yeah, I get it. But are you singing the, that really? Hell yeah! Is dude, the I world that singing it? That's what I'm saying. Like the world's not jumping on. Lose yourself. That was a movie connected song. That one people still sing to this day. You know, there's just not enough of them anymore. You're the best around. <sighs> it's a great song. I don't think that was written for that movie. I don't know if it was, but no, but it's what you associate it with when you hear it. True. Just like Eye of the Tiger, you immediately think Rocky. What are you doing over there? I hear the mic that keeps thump, 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 thumping. What are you doing? You rubbing your mic? Not me. <laughs> Unless it's this. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John, to you. What do you what do you want to talk about? We're going in like a round robin thing. Just we didn't want to do an episode. We we haven't talked in forever. What have you guys been yeah. up to before we move on, I guess? Like anything We're, new? Well let that part out. Like we didn't want to do an episode. Yeah. Yeah. We I'll edit that out. We, just, we wanted to we wanted to take another week off. <laughs> it's, we, we, you guys have like, had several weeks off. Like what are you bitching about? I mean, define off. <laughs> you haven't been had the podcast for the Hollywood Outsider in a few weeks. All right. I, we would have been on the South by Southwest episode, but we didn't get free tickets as press. So, Not you sure, know, man. gotta do, gotta do the work. To get the part. Like Amanda's done the work. <laughs> Damn. Hear that, Amanda? She, she just threw shade at you. Yeah. All right. So, uh, here's a question or a topic that we can jump on real quick that I thought was an interesting topic. All right. So how has the evolution of storytelling formats and movies and television over the past four years with the rise of anthology series like black mirror, twilight zone, uh, true detective, stuff like that. Um, and critically acclaimed limited series such as Chernobyl, the queen's gambit impacted audience engagement and viewing habits. Okay, you know this was supposed to be a fun episode, right? You're writing book reports and shit. Well, I yeah. I want I, 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 I got time. I gotta have to. I gotta do some research. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to show up as if I was like I know. I, as it, I'm not used to you preparing, so I, I didn't know. I wasn't expecting that. That's weird. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to show up prepared and engaged, and wanted so to be. What like, was the question? How do you put so many titles in a row? What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how do you? <laughs> All right. So with anthology series, so I'm th- I'm talking about Black Mirror, Mirror, uh, Twilight Zone, Story. Chernobyl. A- as sure, a, I got like it. I got that part. One shot limited series. Yeah. Like, how do you think these one shots or or anthology series have impacted audience engagements and view- viewing habits? I mean, Chernobyl wasn't a anthology because it was only one season. No, yeah. He said like for, limited series or anthology. Things that yeah, don't go no. on and on and on, right? That's right. what you're going with? That's okay. what I'm going for. And Fargo would be included in this because it's a different yeah, cast it's an anthology. anthology. Yep. It's it's anthology. Um, okay. uh, all the Mike Flanagan stuff, anthology series or limited limited series. I just think it, I think it gives the ability to have more varied content. I don't know if it's... Um, change viewing habits i think people just i think just streaming in general has changed viewing habits it's just people watch whatever they want to see more yeah. of the same things they love and they love to see things where they just see it and they're done you know i'm gonna i'm gonna say something that aaron's gonna dick punch me for but yeah, you could literally say the and i'm i'm game <laughs> <laughs> i feel like westworld felt like an eight it felt like an anthology it was written as an anthology what? series like each I got dick each punch. season is gonna call you a, what each season was self-contained, right? Like you, there was very, very, spe- ish. yeah, very specific things they were trying to accomplish in each season. So I don't know if I needed season two, three, four of Westworld. I got done with one and I'm like, I'm good. I got done with two and I was good. And I got done with three and I was good. I got done with four and I was good, you know? So I don't know if it's necessarily the fact that it's an anthology or not. I think it's just a matter of, Tell me a self-contained story in each season. I like that. Yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, that's, I don't agree with that completely, but I do agree with the sentiment. So, right. Um, the idea that, you know, we, we kind of, I think we're sick of cliffhangers, right? We're just, yeah, there, there's too much ambiguity. There's too many unknowns. You don't know if your show is ever going to come back. I think people are just sick to death of being left hanging. So, so there probably is more, there probably are more cases of people going to limited series and anthologies and things like that. So they get a conclusive ending when the season's over. They don't have to sweat it or at least get most of their questions answered by the, by the end of it. 
Yeah, no, there's been a lot of times where I've had conversations with like you in particular, Aaron, and some other people about different shows. And, and it's like, oh, well, the show's over with. Well, did it have an ending is the next question. Yeah. I won't go to it if it doesn't have an ending. Yeah. And and I, I, I like the idea that these that this, people are working towards completing a story versus trying to just stay on air as long as possible you know it's it means that the stories are usually more concise they're more they're more clearly told there's more more of that time real estate that people want to use up is used uh with with intent as opposed to let's just fill some shit here and so there's a lot that i think goes into creating these i just finished up true detective season four which was amazing And even then, that series (laughs) left so much on the table that you're still walking away going, oh, that was such a good season. And that was such a good like couple of shows. They leave so much on the table that they don't even bother answering, but you're still happy you watched it. When you think about how many pilots get presented during pilot season in February that don't even get picked up to actually shoot a pilot in May, right? Let alone then the things that get shot, how many of those get axed? before it ever actually makes the cut. So if we could just not pick one thing that's going to go five to seven years and instead say, I'm going to pick you up and you're only going to get 13 episodes, you know, we could pick up more content and more shows. We don't need more, more content. Mm-mm. We can't play. We can give, we can give, we give more writers and more showrunners and we get more people in the business having jobs because we're allowing space for, Many 13 episode one season things, many, many small books versus, you know, seven book, you know, Stephen King. I think there's already too much fluff, too much junk out there. There's Mm -hmm. already, I think they need to, they need to bring it back. If anything, there's too much stuff out there that isn't being watched. That's why you have so many shows that only go a a couple, one season or a couple seasons. Then you get people complaining that, well, they're not going to go on. Well, it wasn't a hit. Well, it seemed like everybody I know was watching it. Well, that's not how ratings work. Right. You know, I mean, it's got to be more than just your friends. Like it has. And these days it isn't even so much of how many people watch it as it is the social media relevance from it. You got to talk about it. If you get euphoria when it started, it wasn't really getting a ton of watches, but people were talking about it like passionately. The people behind the show were talking about it passionately, which was driving up social media, which in can what that essentially leads to is more people are talking about their streaming service. So even though necessarily people aren't watching it more at like huge game of Thrones numbers, you still have people talking about that network, which gets people subscribing and that pushes subscriptions up. That's what they're going for. So it isn't always about watches anymore. Like the game has changed completely. People don't realize that, but the game has changed. So at some point we reached a peak in how we communicate our appreciation for movies and television. And I, I don't know when it happened, but we're on the downward slide of it where people don't talk about the stuff they're watching like they used to. They don't get as as involved with it the way they used Too to. Too tired, man. Yeah, everyone's that's exactly right. But I think because of that, people are forgetting that bec- if they're not talking about the shows they love and if they're not if they're not out there sharing their thoughts about something with the rest of the world, then people aren't going to be able to have the opportunity that they had to enjoy something, which means that they, they continue further enjoying it gets less and less. I haven't had many other than the things that I review and what like whatnot. There haven't been too many things where I'm shouting to people, you got to check this out. You got to check that out. I mean, I just started watching um, The Gentleman on Netflix. That yeah. might be one of them. It's building to be one of those shows because I'm really mm-hmm. into it now. And I'm like, oh, all right, finally something I just want to watch episode to episode to episode to episode. And Roadhouse, <laughs> I saw it in oh. South By. Then I watched it again because my wife wanted to see it. And I've already watched parts of it a third time. It's I haven't rewatched a movie that quickly and I don't know how long because it's just so much fun, dumb fun. Yeah. And I wanted some dumb fun, but I got, I got it. And I'm telling people about it. I'm like, this is awesome. This is awesome. They're like, I hated it because you know, Patrick Swayze. I'm like, well, he's dead. This one's cool. Go watch right. it. <laughs> Check it out. Yeah. You know, he's not, <laughs> well, see, Swayze's not mad. He's not a ghost to me about it. That's the other thing. Oh, Jesus, Aaron. Sir. Get the movie, Ghost. That's what I meant. I know. Yeah. We got it. We got it. <laughs> so, we were giving it the time of day that it needed. Right. Not a literal so, ghost, although that's possible. I and guess. now we've given it way too much. Right. Now we've we've killed it. We've shot it in the middle of the road. Uh, so 
we just you just experienced this again recently where you shared your thoughts about how you know let's remember the 2016 uh oh, Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters movie yeah. and how great it was and it was it was like a uh it was like a flag you threw up that said, hey, why don't you just kick me in the junk over and over and over again oh, yeah. for doing yeah. that? And and that's the thing. That, I think that's what happens when people uh, who are afraid to share things. I, I know that I, I don't always like to share things out there because I just don't have the time and energy to try to fight with idiots about how my opinion is just as important and they don't need to show up and tell me that I'm wrong. Uh, I can appreciate the fact that they don't agree, but not that I'm wrong, you know? I mean, do you appreciate that, though? I mean, you called them idiots. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, well, they were acting. I mean, some of them were acting. Kind of, I don't, especially the the <laughs> ones that were going after Aaron again. <laughs> yeah, they were kind of like, they were just being ridiculous. Look, I like 2016's Ghostbusters better than I like Afterlife and better than I like the new uh, Frozen Empire. It doesn't make me wrong. It makes me have a different opinion than you. And... I'm not saying you're anything. I'm not calling you a misogynist. I'm not calling you sexist or anything. I just like that. I think it's more in spirit with what the original movie was than you that didn't like it, obviously. But they were writing like childish little men (laughs) that did have a sexist uh, ideology. And that's on them. I'm not talking about people that just didn't like the movie. That's fine. But when you're writing, you just, you're you're so woke. I'm like, it's not woke. It had female comedians. That doesn't make it woke, you jackass. Right. (laughs) <laughs> you know that's something that drives me nuts like i hate it when people take a word that meant something good and they've turned it into they turn it into like it's some political ideology that's wrong you know being woke used to be a good thing and i hate now when it's people just, take it and they're just trying to make everything because they're making it you know it's a negative so they're using dog it whistle to, yeah it's a dog whistle there you go uh, yeah the new ghostbusters which i'm not you know I thought it was, eh. but McKenna Grace is great in it, and she has a character arc that some people are calling woke because they want to spin it as a negative, and I—that's that's ridiculous. It it's things that people do. It's it's like a real thing that exists in the world that you live in. So just get used to it, move past it. My God, and not the ghost part. The ghosts aren't real. <laughs> I mean, speaking of segues, well, then the thing that, on the she, internet the thing like that getting... she did wasn't real either. Uh, that's true. <laughs> part of it. Go ahead, Troy. You're trying to segue. Yeah. Well, so, well, speaking of segues and things on the internet and people acting like idiots, uh, my next one was uh, the Kate Middleton fiasco <laughs> of how the internet decided to just completely oh. conspiracy theory the shit out of this thing and then to find out that the poor woman has cancer and yeah. she's going to cancer treatments and that all these people had a backpedal for looking like assholes. Yeah. So I guess the question is, is in the age of 24-7 access to information and sometimes 24-7 access to people... Where is the responsibility of social media companies and news agencies not to exploit a human being? I was laughing because um, I all the people that were acting like the internet detectives, like they figured something out, and this poor woman is suffering with a personal illness while you're making all these comments and attacks and da 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 da. And I ugh, it just it made me laugh because I'm like, that's what you get. <laughs> that's what you get <laughs> for spending your time obsessing over something that doesn't concern you. You know, just move on with your life. Spend that time doing something for your family, for your mom, for your kids, or, you know, write a book, write a play, do something constructive. The specific question, though, is where is the responsibility of the people that run these platforms? None. Should they not say, not their pro- hey, no. this, is a, this is a human being, it's a personal thing, like, we're going to we're gonna delete these posts. It's just not necessary. No. Like, to, where does the line get? No, where do they draw the line? That's freedom of speech, man. I, I am full... Full stop. Freedom of speech. As long as it's not dangerous or threatening, uh, that is not dangerous or threatening. It's just sad and spiteful. Um, you know, if you're like, here's where we meet to attack the Capitol, that's dangerous. <laughs> you know, <laughs> or if you're threatening an individual, that's dangerous. If they were threatening Kate Middleton, then that should be taken down and the person should have police escorts to the big prison cell. But uh, you're in the public life. You're, unfortunately, you're going to be on funnel under much speculation. And the idea of social media is a platform for wide open free speech. And that's just part of it. I, it's sad. I don't like it, but I, I don't think they should be taking things down because then how do you separate that? Where's, where's the, where's the line? You know, where's that line exist? What's right? What's wrong? Who determines what's right and what's wrong? Is it ideological? Is it political? Is it 
gender based? Is it race based? Is it like who determines? I mean, in this world of identity politics, no one's ever going to be right a hundred percent all of the time by doing that. Yeah, I just I, it bothers me because I feel like social media is is good on one side because we do get news faster, but at the same time, it's also not news unless it's been corroborated by two sources. And you know, go watch the newsroom. The newsroom is a fantastic show about how they just will not put things on the air until they actually have two confirmations of something happening because I feel like we get misled a lot. And that's what's led to this whole China's influencing TikTok, and we got to take TikTok down because pe- pe- there's things getting put on yeah. TikTok that are influencing them. I don't agree with that either. I think that's <laughs> the, that's the people that own, t- you know, the people that own TikTok are the employees. They own the major- almost the majority of the company are the employees. And, and I the think they have a lot of American, American owners investors. too. I believe they yeah. have a lot of American owners too. Correct. I don't agree so with that. It. In fact, I, I I find it fascinating that the government is so they can't agree on anything, but they can agree on banning TikTok. What? I don't get it. I don't even use TikTok. I don't like TikTok. I don't care about TikTok. I don't need to see people reacting to things that I'm watching. All right, I'll I'll react on my own. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I say that my favorite was, as we have my, a podcast. My favorite was the uh, reaction. The senators in the House of Representatives people that were telling me that they were going to ban TikTok on TikTok. <laughs> That's fascinating. That's Inception. There's your callback right there. There's your Inception blooper. There you go. There you go. There John, you go. do you want to address that at all? I there's. I mean, I'm 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 torn on this. I think that there's. I think that as far as like free speech, free speech is something that we you know we've we've we depend on in this country, and it's something that protects us from our government, right? However, we have companies who have developed these platforms in which people can exercise their, their free speech, but then those companies, one way or the other, end up becoming responsible for what's being said on their platform. So as corporations and uh, that need to protect their own assets and their own, and their own well-being should ideally have the ability of saying, hey, this is my actual platform. You can't do anything like that on my platform. It doesn't affect f- free speech because, again, free speech is all about the government silencing us, not these corporations. However, the second we start giving corporations the ability of silencing us, they're going to abuse it to an nth degree that is even worse than any sort of corporate, uh, any sort of government. So it's it's kind of like a fine line that I don't know how to walk. Troy, what do you think? I mean, do you think they should ban TikTok? They shouldn't ban TikTok, no. But I think that there should be a level of social media is now news, and therefore rules around news should apply to social media platforms, just like it applies to the news agencies. Like things have to be credible, things have to be fact checked, things have to be sourced. It, yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be reported immediately. Take a hot. But it's minute. not a news Figure organization. What's going on. Corporations are protected. They do have um, free speech privileges too, so they are protected. It, it's a it's true. They have privileges. So they they can't be treated like a news organization because they're not claiming to be a news organization. They're just letting people post their own thing. If anything, you should hold the news organizations accountable. I think if you brand yourself a news organization, there should be a set of standards, and I believe there are, that not everyone follows. That's why Fox News has to con, you know <laughs> register as <laughs> entertainment versus a news organization. I think that's the problem is that we have a very blurry line between news and entertainment. Well, I think it's a problem on both sides of that aisle. Like, I definitely right. don't think it's one side or the other. Um, but yeah, I don't know how you combat how you combat it. I don't think banning TikTok is the answer because then what you're going to do is you're going to start. Then you're going to have. Then basically you have communism, man. You have you have the government dictating what we can see and hear. And what's appropriate for our our whittle whittle ears and eyes? I don't think Is that's it right. Communism answer. or fascism? Both. Sure. I don't care. Either one. I'm very tired. It's been a long couple of weeks. But you know what I'm saying. It's the government controlling what we see and do. And I don't think that's you know we don't need dictatorships like that. Agree. All right. Way to go. Way to bring the room down, Troy. <laughs> Sorry. Who's who's? Is it Troy or is it me? Who is it? Whose turn is it? Well, Troy just went. Okay. So. All right. Well, two thirds of people prefer streaming now. Well, it was like an IndieWire article that came out a couple, like a week or two ago, and I haven't had a chance to talk about it. Um, I, I just, I just want to point out that movie theaters are still doing fairly well. Like they're not bottoming out. Contrary to popular belief, they're still making quite a bit of money. Blockbusters are doing well. 
it's just, you know, and this is a time of year when movies usually haven't historically been huge. So that's not really a surprise. But more people are preferring streaming because they don't want to go out of the house. Now, everybody will throw the expense. Oh, it's just too expensive to go to the movie. When you take into account what you're paying on streaming and everything else, and you can get a list for 25 bucks a month and see as many as you want. It's really just a preference. I don't want to, I don't want to leave the house and that's fine if that's your preference, but it does make me sad that that many people yeah. would rather sit at home and watch stuff. Cause Netflix at 1599, you take out one Starbucks drink and boom, you got a list and you can go see three movies a week. Exactly. And I get, guess what? I have yet to see the, the level of quality on Netflix consistently week to week match movie theaters. They don't make great movies. They make a lot of, they're making product. They're making quantity. So it's a lot of mediocre movies. Why you don't hear us review many of them? <laughs> we also don't review anything on Apple either because Martin Scorsese gets the whole budget. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have any movies worth watching on Apple except that one and Argyle. <laughs> like they don't have many. Palmer. But they got a lot of Palmer's great shows. still in the top 10, man. It's been there for like eight years. It's still in the top 10 because they have so much content. They're doing it right because all they have is sci-fi means- TV, which are uh, both your alleys. They are not doing it right. I don't know anyone who's dying for an Apple uh, subscription. I'd call it a prescription because it's, it's for, I think you have something wrong with you if you're, if you're spending your money on Apple, but you too, you love sci-fi. So it's right up your alley. Well, I mean, they had Masters of Air also, which was really good. It's fine. And they had Ted Lasso and they have Shrink. What do you mean? It's fine. It's How- fine. Did you say it's fine? I saw one episode. I'm like, eh, it's not Band of Brothers. It's not getting me right from the get-go. How? That's just the air almost was a little bit better than I, Band of Brothers. I watched I one episode, to be fair. That's all I watched is one episode. Yeah. No, it's... I'm not going back to it. I, I gave it a shot. I'm done. I got so many... The Gentleman is captivating me. Guess what? I'm watching what I'm enjoying. I'm not, there's so many good things out there. Nobody's wrong here. Nobody's you're losing. so wrong. No, Nobody's you're losing. actually wrong. No, Shut up wrong. five years to watch Ted Lasso. You don't got to vote in this. <laughs> <laughs> At least Troy will try it in a, in a recent, you know, eventually. You're like, well, oh, I'll see it when it's over. Okay. And I'm Maybe glad I did. When everyone in the world's telling you to watch it, I'll, I'll get to it. Yeah, I'll get to yeah, it. Yeah, no, I'll get to it. I, You know what? At least I got to it. I did get to Masters of Air. Didn't, I just didn't care about watching the next episode. Oh, you're so wrong. It's such a good show. Okay. Maybe it's the wrong time for me. It, may, it could be the wrong time for you. I, I'll get, I'll accept that because Maybe it's the wrong time. I'll watch Ted, it. Ted Lasso uh, was the now. wrong time for me to watch that shit. You don't know. You never tried. I tried. I, uh, all right. I mean, it's hard I, having I, a point I, that I makes that is a point, but it's a point. I can't, I can't talk to you anymore. It's a fact. You didn't even try it. I tried it. I I did try it and I finished it, it in a month. Yes, when you tried it, but you didn't try it like when it was recommended. I tried it Masters of Air when it came out. When you recommended it. <sighs> Look, I believe that you both have valid opinions that apply to yourselves. <laughs> I respect that. Shut up, Shoy. <sighs> what what I don't get is um what why are people taking all these you, you ever notice they do all these polls, they're just trying to clickbait you? to start those arguments because they know so many people fight over the whole streaming versus theatrical. So there's so many articles about that with different polling data just to get people fight. That's the whole reason that they have them. It's just to get people fighting. Well, I think that also just shows your level of like, I'm clicking on those polls because you can't stay away from them. I've never seen those polls personally because I don't even look for those polls. Sometimes they get me, man. Sometimes I got to sit there and I'll be clicking on something. I'm like, oh, all right, let's see where this is going to go. And I get like three clicks into it. And I'm like, all right, I'm done. Anything else you want to talk about? You still got, you got a book report here. You wanna- I do got a book report. All right. So um, I, I like how the guy who doesn't read well writes the longest paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, I need all the words. I need all the words. I have a hard time with words, but I'm going to make more words. It's like the behind the scenes of this is like Aaron's got bullet, bullet, bullet. Troy's got bullet, bullet, bullet. Aaron and our has got paragraph, page one, paragraph, page two. Beginning in 1865. Uh, why does the dyslexic using more words than everybody else? That's my favorite part of this so far. All right. So 
There's an intriguing trend of blurring genre lines and genre boundaries in recent movie and television series. Uh, and to give you examples of this, you have Stranger Things, The Witcher, and Westworld. They've all reshaped our expectations of storytelling and challenged the traditional genre conventions. Uh, what impact do you believe this creative experimentation has on audience engagement and the evolution of narrative art forms in an ever-expanding landscape of entertainment? Okay. Before this is really a on. new question. This is a continuation question because you're still in the question it's, of art form. Yeah, it's the same question pretty much, but it's reformed and it's it's spicier. But I want to, I just got to give you credit. You got to that whole thing and I don't think you started once. I <laughs> <laughs> so we just gave you so much shit about it. And you know what? It's on us. Wow. We're, we're the asshole. <laughs> Troy, uh, I'll throw this to you. This is right up your alley. I mean, I think Stranger Things is good because Stranger Things pulls at a specific audience and a specific nostalgia factor because the minute you throw kids on bikes and boom, I'm immediately transported back to the 1980s, E.T., Super 8, that kind of thing, right? Um, The Witcher, anything that's high fantasy, anything that's mystical pulls me into that Lord of the Rings, Dark Tower kind of environment you got Westworld gives me that really great sci-fi brain bleed type trying to figure out the puzzle I don't think that anything in there is really about the genre or the blending of anything it's really just understanding your audience if you come in and know who you are talking to and what you are making this for and who you're making this for you could tell whatever story you want because it's going to land with those people so really, it's a matter of they've done a much better job of understanding who the audience is and what the audience is asking for rather than just writing something to write something. Yeah, and I would piggyback off that. I, I agree with that uh, wholeheartedly. And, but in terms of reshaping our expectations, I think it has hurt other shows. Agree. You know, I mean, the Lord of the Rings show, I know some people liked it. I think, Trey, you liked it or didn't like it? I don't remember where you landed with it. I mean, it it, it has it has right. flaws. I'm not I'm not a you know, um, J.R.R. Tolkien, you know, scholar or anything that I know all everything inside and out, but I was able to follow it well enough, right? A common per that sounds so bad, common person, um, a non-educated <laughs> Tolkien reader um, would have a really hard time following it because they wouldn't know all of the different alien beings and gods and spirits and how the world was formed and sure. created and all of this stuff. So a yeah, for them, person. it's it's not an easy, it's not an dumb, easy watch. Dumb. <laughs> right. um, but yeah for uh, and then you have the uber token fans who are like well that Smart wasn't in the book and that wasn't this and that wasn't that right the bright you need ones. to find someone that's just like that just wants to be back in the universe put me back in the universe and let me enjoy a journey well my god that was a much i just want to know if you liked it but <laughs> My, my point was the, the way that the way the ending the way the ending happens in that I love how the ending happens and just go what all right well my, like, my point was that shows like um Game of Thrones and and show and The Witcher and shows like that like these high fantasy epics that have really elevated the art form have made it harder for those kinds of shows to land yeah because I think if you wouldn't have had Game of Thrones. And this applied to Wheel of Time as well, because I think Wheel of Time really suffered. Because I remember watching that first season going, God, why don't they have they have this the same budget? Why doesn't this look like Game of Thrones? Like, it should right. look like that. Right. And I think that really hurts this kind of storytelling. Because I, if it wasn't for a show like Game of Thrones or Westworld or these things that are just beautifully realized, I feel like we would be more accepting of these other shows. And we would probably be talking about them more. But because... They didn't quite reach this master level of effects meets acting meets storytelling. They're on a lower rung. You know what I mean? And I don't know if it's fair, but I do think that has affected a lot of other high fantasy, high concept storytelling. When I think about Game of Thrones, I think about often the, that first season was mostly a people story. It's not until the very How last. How many effects of- in the beginning? In the whole first season, there's hardly any. Yeah, it's all people, right? So you they buy you into with these characters, and they really sell you on these characters. Mm-hmm. And it's not until the last episode that you see the first hint of like a dragon and the first hint of what's to come in the next following seasons. No, they build and it so, in your mind. It's all in your imagination. Yeah. They're telling the stories from the past, and yeah. right. 
So all of this is, is, and that's what worked with Game of Thrones, where it got you, in, it, it reeled you in. Because if they would have showed up the first day with dragons, there are the there are those people who are, especially the time in which Game of Thrones came out, there are the, there are those people who became fans of the show who would have never loved it if it was like, oh, there's magic and dragons in this. Sure. I'm not that kind of nerd, you know. Sure. But now those people are really into the whole kind of storytelling and that there's an acceptance of it. Um, you mentioned Wheel of Time, which has a great story, but the budget was caca. Well, I don't, it wasn't the budget. It had a huge budget. It just looked like it doesn't have a huge budget. That's right. what I don't get. That drives right. me nuts. I don't know why it's Prime the shows can't. Rosamund Pike. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Rosamund, she carried that. I never even went back to the second episode because it bothered me, or second season because it bothered me so much. I watched right. the whole first season. I really enjoyed the story. Mm -hmm. It looked cheap. Same with uh, uh, the Lord of the Rings show. When I watched it, I felt like it looked cheap. And it shouldn't. They threw every dollar that Amazon has in their coffers at that series. There's no reason it should look or feel to me like it's a cheap show. And I think it, it doesn't look like it should. And then Bring you have power? The Witcher, power which I don't think was nearly as expensive. Hang on, he's, as Troy's, Troy's jumping off that. What? Yeah, Ring of Power felt cheap to you? Yeah, when I was watching it, I was kind of, I thought very much, it's very similar to Wheel of Time. I just thought it didn't look clean. The effects didn't look clean to me. I thought it looked hmm. cleaner than Wheel of Time, but the story was weaker than Wheel of Time. Yeah, that's what I, I would agree with John, our John. No, oh, maybe, maybe that's what bothered me. I don't remember. But I, I mean, remember the going. It, the Mount Doom sequence was amazing. Like, I, I remember watching how that. far in I was, was like, that though? I watched two episodes. The other was six. Yeah. See, I didn't see it. I couldn't yeah, get two. You would have seen two. You would have seen Numenor. Numenor was fast, fabulously I, I well didn't done. Think it was very impressive. I'm sorry. That's because maybe we're all used to it being on the bottom of an ocean, and this is the first time we actually got to see it realized in real life. Psh, maybe. Okay. Well, mine took a neuter showing now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're kind of uh, coming across like royalty here. All right. I. Falutin. Uh Speaking of dragons, by the way, uh, you guys see the new damsel on Netflix? The dragon design is phenomenal. Yeah, I haven't seen it, but I saw pics of the pictures of that dragon, and I'm so in for it. It's I, just really good. Yeah, I like that. One. It's on the list with all the content, because there's so much content. <laughs> so why don't we just talk about putting more content out there, because this is my question, oh. and then I don't really care what Variety says about comedy movies being dead, because I think we need to bring some back, because Breakfast Club... <laughs> Just turned 40 years old this past week. And I have to ask why there aren't more movies like this that talk about issues teens are facing today or even like how Gen Z has to interact with boomer grandparents and talking about the different like we talk about mental health a lot, you know, and there's just a lot of how people can't relate to each other because of these giant gaps in the generations and how they do things. And I'm just curious why there isn't more content or movies or stories around things the way Breakfast Club resonated with all of us growing up that's a good point um, why don't those stories work today i mean there are a few i don't know how much far they how much they break through i mean i feel like 13 reasons why it's probably the the biggest one that's broken through and that was a series right um because that really spoke to a lot of younger people the, there's been some good ones edge of 17 i thought was a fantastic movie it just didn't catch on um what was the are you there Margaret, it's or are you there, Margaret? It's me, God, or whatever. That was a great movie. I, I don't think they make. I don't think they're making as many of them, or they don't get as wide of a distribution as they used to. That's probably what it is. People don't go see them as much. I agree with you, though. We need more of those films for this current coming up generation. They need their own movies, you know. Yeah, because they're making a lot of stuff that resonates with us because they're remaking the stuff we saw as kids. Oh, God, they're right. doing. So I'm much surprised. There, I'm surprised there wasn't a Breakfast Club remake. Oh, they will. You know. That that is gonna happen. That's a thing that will happen. You know it will. Sixteen well, candles will get remade. You'll get you'll get all of them remade. Uh, detention, <laughs> redoing a detention thing <laughs> these days. That would be interesting. Of what? <laughs> Just a, a redoing a story about kids going to detention. Oh. What would that look like today? They're just playing on their switch, right? Or you know, there's there's a jail cell or something they got to sit in. <laughs> That's a, that's a, that's one of the best I think of all time too. Is it really forty years old? Yep, forty years <sighs> old. Come on, old. Uh, ma March twenty fourth. I'm so old. Oh, Damn. Thanks for bringing the room down, Troy. With that, no, one. no, that wasn't a, that was a 
That was actually a happy thought because I was thinking back because I love that movie. Uh, I I remember because everybody has that character they identify with in that movie, right? That's what's mm-hmm. so great about it. I mean, Anthony they're kind Michael of Hall. you're Anthony Michael Hall. I'm Bender for sure. Um, I don't think that's really a doubt. I even had the trench coat. What What about you, Troy? Yeah, probably more the Emilio Estevez when I was in high school. I can't can't picture like just extra not necessarily the sports related, but just the the pressure the pressure of always being perfect uh, and doing the things the right way and you might be like a mix of of Clark and Johnson then right and they might go yeah. on Emilio also maybe I had a little Ellie Sheedy in me because I had dandruff so <laughs> sorry that's so <laughs> so rude uh, you know then you get the shampoo I did have that trench coat though I totally dressed like him for like a summer. I was okay with it. <sighs> you know what? Let's end it on one thing. Then we're going to go into Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. I just want to ask you guys this question. I think it's very important. If Cobra Kai faced off with Shonuff and his gang from The Last Dragon, who who would be the true master? Who would win? <laughs> who would uh, win Shonuff. that fight? Huh? Shonuff. Well, why is that? What's your what's your reasoning? Because Cobra Kai is a bunch of kids who are just learning karate. Show enough is a bunch of street thugs who use karate. And have mystical powers. And have mystical, yeah. Who the master? Show enough. See? It's in the name. Come on, Troy. Convince us it's Cobra Kai. I know you're trying to figure out a way. Well, I mean, Cobra Kai, those guys ended up winning it all and are going to the national global tournament, so... I don't see show enough bringing home any trophies. Uh, do you no, see? No, he's too busy bringing home money from robbing stores and stuff by using karate kicks. <laughs> he glows and shit. Unless Cobra Kai can recruit Leroy. Now, if, if they could do that, <laughs> then I think I think they stand a chance. You know what I mean? How do you know they're not fighting Leroy in the, in the last season? No, oh, you can't fight Leroy. No, no. He's retired. He won. Let him retire and... Let him live out his days. Is it last year? Is it coming out this year, right? Because the new Karate Kid, it's coming out before the Karate Kid movie in December, the way that I understand it. They're filming now. I don't think. I've not seen a release date on season six. <sighs> Hopefully. It was originally, it's originally was supposed to be December 2, 2023, but the strike pushed it into 2024. Okay. All right. Well, hey, we're going to go to a couple of reviews here. Thanks, everybody, for listening to us just ramble. You know, normally we have a very, very, uh, regimented and focused episode this is just 3d talking um but if you want to support us we do have a bunch of bonus content including like some behind the scenes from south by southwest including some looks at the fall guy and roadhouse panels our show is independently funded you can see those on patreon where we uh we basically put bonus content for patreon to help fans support their favorite podcast once you sign up you get immediate access to all the x to all the content in your tier and if you want to support the show, just go to patreon.com slash the Hollywood Outsider. You also get the Inspired by a True Story podcast one week early that way. Now let's go to reviews. First one is in the land of saints and sinners. Ireland, 1970s. Eager to leave his dark past behind, Finbar Murphy, played by Liam Neeson, leads a quiet life in the remote coastal town of Glen Coastal Meal, far from the political violence that grips the rest of the country. But when a menacing crew of terrorists arrive, led by a ruthless woman named Dorian, played by Carrie Condon, Finbar is drawn into an increasingly vicious game of cat and mouse, forcing him to choose between exposing his secret identity or defending his friends and neighbors. Now, this is a uh, violent uh, rated R kind of mystery thriller directed by Robert Lawrence. When does this drop? Uh, It comes out Friday. So the 28th. This will be coming out this weekend, but Aaron, you were able to take a peek at this. What is it that Liam Neeson brings to the movie that makes us excited for seeing an R-rated spin on this kind of story? Uh, Well, you've got Ireland, 1974. You've got a lot of people that speak in an Irish accent, so that's cool. But but also you've got Liam Neeson, you know, just bringing, bringing what he brings to every role. I mean, he's very much the character that you're familiar with, right? He's... He's got a darker edge to him, but he also has kind of a heart of gold to a degree, even though it's a dark heart. I mean, he is a hit man, but he does replace, you know, every time he buries a body, he plants a tree. So there's a good side to him. You know, he's done a, a run of action 
kind of tepid action films over the last decade, probably since Taken came out. He's done a lot of them. This is the best Liam Neeson film I've seen in years. It's very taut. It's very exciting. It's a, it's a fun thriller. And, you know, he, he's a hitman who just wants to get out of here, maybe move to California, maybe write some music. He wants to be an artist. Maybe he doesn't even know. He just, he knows he's tired of this world of death that he's chosen. And there's already a young guy who's Jack Gleason speaking of game of Thrones, Jack Gleason from, you know, played Joffrey in game of Thrones. He plays Kevin Hitz's competition and he's already an up and comer. So he doesn't even need to stay there anymore. There's somebody that's ready to take his spot. So he's on his way out, but then he finds out that a pub owner's daughter, a young girl that he befriends is being abused by somebody staying with her mother. And it's also connected kind of to an IRA group that just blew up a mother and three children in Belfast. So you've got some, some dark forces conspiring against him and they're led by Carrie Condon, who is Doreen McCann. And she is awesome. She's fantastic. It's, it's just like him versus her. She's got this nice mix of empathy and monstrosity, a great foe for these kinds of movies. And it's just a white knuckle thriller all the way to the end. No, I'm I'm looking at the cast and I'm seeing that there's quite a lot of Irish folks in here. Cole Meanley's in there. Um, do you feel like they represent Ireland well in this movie or do you feel it becomes more cliche, stereotyped as the movie goes along? Uh, I think I think here in the description, you probably think it's very formulaic and we've seen this before and it's pretty by the numbers. I thought it was a very well very well constructed because I feel immersed in the town. The town feels alive and feels real. It feels um, like, you know, Finbar Murphy, who is Liam Neeson's character, really feels like he lives here. Like this is his community and he really cares about these people. And he's doing what he's doing for a reason. It isn't just he stumbled into this and, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to do something about this. No, he really, he's, this is his community. These are his people. And he feels like, I mean, everyone's got the same accent, so they all feel like they belong here. And if you had to like make take a nitpick at the movie, what is the thing that kind of stands out that makes you kind of go like, nah, I don't want to go to the theater and spend the money on this. I'd wait for streaming. Honestly, I don't have anything. I Like I said, best Liam Neeson film in years. Carrie Condon is great. She was nominated for an Oscar for the band um, Banshees of Inishirin. She's proving that it's no fluke. I really love the relationship between Kevin lynch who's uh, jack leeson and finbar murphy like as the movie goes it kind of becomes a different dynamic than what you expect and what it's been i love how that develops and just just where it goes i mean you can say yeah some of it's predictable but so many action movies are predictable it's it's just what you do with it that makes it entertaining or enjoyable and this one's i i really enjoyed it i couldn't take my eyes off it i was thrilled the whole way so any nitpick would be, it is formulaic, probably a plot you could see some things coming, but it's still entertaining. It's still great. I had a great time. Well, you can get the review and the trailer up on our website, thehollywoodoutsider.com. If uh, $10 was the full price of admission, Aaron, what would you give in the land of saints and sinners? Uh, I think this is a taut, energetic outing stacked with some memorable performances. And it's, again, Liam Neeson's best movie in years. So I give it eight bucks. Eight bucks. High praise. Yeah, go see it. Check it out this weekend. Now we should talk about this. It's already out. Might be, you know, gone before you hear this. I don't know. But we got to talk about Ghostbusters Frozen Empire and what this means for the Ghostbusters going forward, I guess. We all three saw this, yeah? Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Yep. When the discovery of an ancient artifact unleashes an evil force, the Ghostbusters, new and old, must join forces to protect their home and save the world from a second ice age. I got to say, I really, really dug the setup, right? The concept here. I, I liked what they were going with for the villain. There's an opening kind of a, a prelude, if you will, to what's to come. And you, you kind of get a feel for the villain. And I love that setup. I thought that got me so stoked for where the movie was going. Yep. And it's directed by uh, Gail Keenan, who, who also wrote the movie with Jason Reitman. And it's dedicated to Ivan Reitman, who created the original, right? So got that out of the way. You already know all the stars of it. Uh, Paul Rudd, Carrie Coon, Bill Murray, et cetera. Er- Ernie Hudson, who looks great for 79 years old. Jesus Christ. Dude, that great. man that man is a handsome fellow. Yeah, he looks great. There's my man impression for the week. 
Dan Aykroyd also gets a, a meaty role here. So the setup is sound. I really dig the villain. Then it gets into the meat of it. And I got to say, I feel like the movie doesn't know what the hell it wants to be. You know, Afterlife had a nice blend of comedy and drama. This one, I don't feel like there's nothing really funny going on. It's not really a comedy. I just feel like it's not really hitting any cylinder it's trying to hit. It felt very mediocre to me. And kind of like the script was shuffled together. What did you guys think? Totally agree. I think that there was like regurgitated jokes. Um, Bill Murray comes in. He's got one line that you've seen in the trailers that was probably the one funny joke. Um, but doesn't even like come off funny because it wasn't that kind of like a movie the rest of the way. So it feels kind of out of place. Uh, I really dug the opening. I, I think the opening, the concept of the, of the big bad and this person who was able to trap the big bad in the little, you know, brass silver, con- uh, spherical container that they have. I think that, um, there needed to be a little bit more with that person, right? Like who is this and why were they able to capture the guy? Mm -hmm. There wasn't enough of the history. I think that made me care about what happens down the road in the movie. So I think there could have been a little bit more on the front side about the battle between these two people and why these guys were the protectors and maybe even meet the grandmother um, from the setup that happens uh, later on in the movie. Um, I think that just would have flushed that out a little bit more. Um, I didn't mind so much the old and new characters being there. I just felt like there wasn't anything for them to do because it relied on the first and second movie so much that it didn't stand on its own two feet. I think that was the problem with this one. Which is a real bummer, right? Because Garaka was the villain. Garaka is the name of the villain in the movie. Love the concept, the look, the aesthetic, like the visual representation, like everything about that character works. Like the Ice Age is a cool change from you know, all the other Ghostbusters and Still, just felt like it petered out. Yeah, there's even like a a piece in here where it's like the guy is like a literally can like it chills you because you're so scared, right? And you're like you're like you scared to death. I think was the mm-hmm. the line that Paul Rudd uses, and like that never really played out to me. No, and like, I was so excited to have a horror element here. You know? Yeah, that it doesn't really play out that way. I agree that they didn't set up the move, the the Garaka thing with the the fire masters very well. They kind of like left it there, and then, but then you think about how they introduce introduce you to Kumail Nanjani's character, and it makes sense as to why they didn't I- explain that because they wanted to introduce you to this complete. I get worthless, that. Yeah, complete like just slacker. Not not really has a lot of value, and it turns out. Um, he's something else, you know, um, and he doesn't even realize what he is. I, it's just done sloppily and, uh, and done and done in a way that just doesn't work for me. There's a lot of things like that in this movie that just didn't quite work. I found myself going, uh, looking at my watch because the, the incongruent nature of the story bouncing around the way it did just did not lead me anywhere I wanted to be. Yeah. I felt like there were cutaway shots, right? There were cutaway shots that were just, I don't know. It was like it was put together like with not wearing their glasses or something. It was just cutaway shots that just didn't need to be where they were located. And it just felt very much, you know, time beats, right? Here's a three minute sequence. Here's a three minute sequence. Here's a three minute sequence. And it never, those three minute sequences never connected. It was weird. (laughs) I I'm with you a hundred percent. What I find fascinating is if you talk about 2016's Ghostbusters uh, in a positive way, Everybody trashed you on the internet, right? Like, there's just like a big long line of people that just jump on that bandwagon. You say something negative about this one, then there's a whole bunch of people jumping on your... <laughs> Ghostbusters fans are freaking weird. And I'm one of them. But I just think we're weird. We, I, I don't understand. I don't even know if we know what we want. But I would tell you, this is nothing like the original movie. I It didn't have any flourishes of the original movie. The movie's saving grace is mechanic grace, ironically. Mm -hmm. She Mm -hmm. is the best thing about the film, just like she was in the last film. She did get more to do here. And every time she's on, I think she's on. Like, she makes the film interesting. If they just would have figured out what to focus on, I I think that this could have been so much better. I, you know, her storyline was at least interesting from an emotional standpoint. You know, basically, I don't want to go too far into it. I don't want to spoil anything for anyone. But at least she was getting something to do. 
it just felt like it was kind of all over the place. I, I did like that Ernie Hudson got a little love and Dan Aykroyd got a little more love and Bill Murray got less love than the other two guys for once. I like that. There's a positive. Yeah, that's that's something I noticed too. I could I, I walked away going, you know, they really did a good job as far as making sure that Ernie Hudson's character was something important. And I mm-hmm. I, I like that. Whereas yeah, I mean as much as I loved Bill Murray in the other movies, I, I don't think we needed him to be Bill Murray in this one. And, and there's nothing really Paul Rudd has an interesting potential arc because he's like the wannabe stepdad of these of Trevor Spangler and Phoebe Spangler and Finn Wolfhard, who gets very little to do. And uh, McKenna Grace is Phoebe. And there's a there's a a deep undercurrent of a parental wanting to be accepted as a parent, wanting to to treat the kids as a parent and trying to know what the right footing is for a step parent kind of thing. That's an interesting dynamic had they gone all in on it. It's really like 10 minutes of the movie that are that they play like it's a very important part of the movie. I'm like, you barely paid any attention to this throughout the entire movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, you've, you've done very little with this. I just don't think you've earned it. And look, man, just it just wasn't a very good movie. I was just bored through most of it. And I hate to say that because I started so strong. I was so excited for what was coming. And then I just got like, Meh. I mean, come it's on. It stopped being important after a while. You it know. stopped being interesting after a while. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there were, I think all of the pieces were there in this movie. I think part of the challenge in this movie is that, it's like I said, it doesn't drive from A to B to C. It's like there's this whole section of like, uh, you know, Ray has got this shop and he's collecting trinkets and artifacts and he's got a little web video podcast that he's doing that he's like, you know, scanning objects from people. You know, there should have been more around that where the Ghostbusters were actually like, searching houses, apartments, places or whatever to find artifacts. And then as they go through, they can like find artifacts and they can find this grandmother's, you know, collection of stuff and they could actually find, um, Emily Allen's character, Lynn, right. Uh, they could find the house that happened that involves her storyline. And I think that would have just tied it up a little bit more together because it just felt like, you know, there's like this, this thing for these people to do. And there's this thing for these people to do, but those things don't connect. Exactly. So for dollars full price of admission, well, I guess I should ask, do you want another one? Do you want a third one in this particular series? No. You're I done. I can't see I can't I'm I'm done. I can't see myself going back to this well. I I don't I I'll watch the first two movies time and time again. I love those first two movies. I know a lot of people the second one gets a lot of hate. That's fine. I enjoy it for whatever the reason is. Um the afterlife didn't re- doesn't really necessarily do it well for me. And this one definitely didn't do that well. It's hard to say because I feel like there's a lot of good in this movie. They just didn't know how to put it together. So if they can get someone that can help them put together the story in the right way from a delivery perspective, you could have something really, really good. Uh, I definitely do not need the original cast anymore. Like if we're going to focus on the Spanglers, let's focus on the Spanglers. I actually think that hurt the film more than it helped. I, now, Ernie Hudson, I could understand because oh, he, was he was great. in that. Yeah, he was good. He was, I mean, because the whole thing was the, you know, in the post credit sequence that was supposed to actually be part of the movie and not in the post credit sequence. You saw Ernie in the, in the firehouse with the, you know, Ecto one and, you know, coming back to New York. So it sets up that, that feel for the, for the upcoming sequel. So I, I actually liked Ernie Hudson's point of view. I liked Ernie Hudson's little side project he had going on at the abandoned place. Um, no, see, I think that was a cool dynamic too. Then yeah. you really fleshed out. So I, I think there's there. I think there's stuff for Winston's character, definitely story wise. But you know, Ray's quirkiness, I'm I'm over it. And Bill Murray really was just there for Bill Murray's sake in this one. Bill Murray didn't really add anything to the to the party this time around. No offense to Bill, because I think he's amazing at what he does. But if I was still a fan of the real Ghostbusters cartoon, I would probably love this a lot more. But I'm way out of that age demographic. I'm not as um, simplistic in my story te- story appreciation as I was when I was a, re- a fan of the real Ghostbusters because this, this fits into that pretty well. I may not be in the demographic they were trying to serve for, with these two movies. And that being said, I still don't want to see it. 
to see a third one. Yeah, I I feel like this would have been a great half hour cartoon because <laughs> you could have got rid of a lot of the fluff that I don't think connects. <clears throat> That's my biggest problem is you have so many characters, it's too much going on and nothing is coherent and smooth. Uh, McKenna Grace probably gets the the most attention in the story, but it's still not enough to to really carry the film. And it's it's too bad because I love this franchise, man. I love Ghostbusters. The most attention. Finn Wolfhard got nothing to he do. He got nothing. He's driving a car a couple times. He gets slimed and he sticks his finger up the butthole of some slime. That's about it, right? <laughs> that's it. That's what he did. And why? And and that's the thing. Like, why do we need Slimer back again? Because uh, nostalgia. Everything is like just baked on nostalgia. It's hey, all Slimer nostalgia. Slimer was in th- was in f- the 2016 Ghostbusters. Also, yeah, that was a. I enjoyed that movie more. Yeah, I said it. Yeah, I'll say it again. I'll keep saying it. I just rewatched it last night. It's a fun movie. It, the, sli- it the Slimer fun. parts in this movie though have no purpose to the story. None at all. None. Zero. Uh, he doesn't even tell anybody that Slimer's living in the house. You know? Right. He's eating all our snacks. That's such a minor subplot that barely is acknowledged. <laughs> it's just so now, ridiculous. Now, the new ghost, um, which I'm totally slipping the name on that one, um, that possesses things. Possessor. I the think possessor. it was his name, right? Oh, I thought you meant Melody. I thought you meant the... the no, 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 no. Okay. No, Possessor. The one that actually was taking over stuff. Mm-hmm. Like the little tricycles going down the street and driving trucks and cars and that was fun. You know, like that was fun. That was cool. Yeah, that was that's what I wanted. Like that makes sense because it actually had a point of how it actually helps the big bad in the end get into wherever they need to go. So it's like it's like that that ghost makes sense in the story. Slimer makes no sense in the story. That leads me to one of the most irritating scenes I've in the whole thing. More Can irritating than that? Kevin not having glasses. No, Kevin not having glasses. Glass in his glasses was hysterical. I love that. <laughs> okay. The, nope. The, no more irritating than a ghost friend showing up out of nowhere and going like, who the hell's this ghost? Yeah, that's true. You thought uh, it was going to be Harold Ramis, right? Right. Totally thought it was, totally was going to be Harold Ramis. Well, she 100%. thought it was going to be Harold Ramis. Sure too. did. You could tell yeah. that in her face. Now, the, when, she, when she destroys one of the lions... And they start yelling at her as if like that lion wasn't about to p- pounce on a bunch of people and nobody saw it happen. And they're all like, you stupid little girl. Like that was annoying. You, yeah, you blasted a cement lion that tried to eat you that the whole world had already caught on film. But no, right. it's a uh, shame on you. That's a that's a treasured artifact of the city. Right. Yeah. Uh, and they know, that, that was- placed it rather fast because it's there at the end of the movie. Yeah, it is the exact same lion. They, it's like they have those in spares because they get taken over by ghosts in New York all the time. All the time. If it's not ghosts, it's it's the free, they learned after the first movie with the hellhounds. Yeah, and no offense to William Atherton, but William Atherton's character was written weak sauce compared to what he is in the first movie. And they they bank way too much, and I think they did this on Afterlife too. They bank way too much on your love of the first movie instead of committing to this new movie. And that's a problem. I see it. But on afterlife, it makes sense because you're trying to do the transition from old to new and pass that torch. And I let that pass. So so you can't do it in this movie. No, it's got to just let it go. You're dragging it out now. You know, you're dragging it out. Let, Let them be the new face. And I say that as a massive Dan Aykroyd fan, I love Dan Aykroyd. I think he's a very talented man. that's never really gotten his due as a comedic genius, but I still, but you can keep Ernie Hudson because yeah. you know what? He never got a fair due in the first Ghostbusters movie. So yeah, yeah Ernie no, Hudson stuff is good. The special project that Ernie Hudson does is good. Possessor is good. The villain is good. Although you don't even see the villain, but all for like five minutes at the end of the movie, which is really poor. Um, what a waste and the of a whole, cool character. And the whole, uh, what was the fire, not fire starter, but fire, fire master, fire master. Like that, the whole lore behind that could have been half this movie. To be honest, I mean, let's be honest. They're also kind of ripping off the original, you know, the key master, the fire master. I feel like I've seen that before. Yeah, but they, they didn't. <laughs> but, one, but, but in this case, you needed both of them to bring Gozer. In this case, it was actually like just protagonist, just the antagonist. <laughs> right. You needed two to bring Gozer. You need one fire master to take out the garage frozen dude. dude. Yeah. All right. Well, ten hours for prize mission. What do you give uh, Ghostbusters uh, Frozen Empire? John, uh, it's a four fifty for me. Ooh, Troy, I was a, I was a five bucker. Yep, 
and five bucker. It's a matinee. You might enjoy it if you're drunk, stoned, high on Ecto one, if you will. Both. <laughs> it's not. I mean, it's it's not bad. It's just yeah, it's just okay. It could have it could have been okay. so much better. Exactly. There's untapped potential here, and I would see a third one, but man, they would have to really wow me because I am just not. I just feel like there's a lot of waste of potential here. Yeah. You're not even going to give it five bucks. You're, I said you're not going to add the 50 cents in Joe, oh, 50 John. cents in John for the drone. The drone, I thought would have been worth 50 cents. No, that was annoying to me. <laughs> the drone trap. I thought that was pretty clever. You didn't like no, that? it was cool and it's clever, but it's like, I felt at that point, they're just trying to buy um, a score out of me and I wasn't <laughs> going to give it to them. Good. Good for you for standing your ground. All right, that's right. All right, well, we should get out of here. But before we go, I got I to gotta say, I mean, I, I can't not say it. B- Busted makes me feel good. <laughs> oh, no. 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 It just it Next does. time you head to the theater to not see <laughs> Ghostbusters, and never use that line ever again. It just does. You know, Busted makes me feel good. All right. Go buy popcorn. <laughs> <laughs>